Okay, everybody. Well, we've only got about half an hour, so and it's quite a large panel, as you can see. I'm Pippa Davis from FYI Network, who's got a platform of local websites across South Wales. Um, uh, and uh, I've asked everybody to speak very, very quickly. Um, they're each going to talk a little bit about their projects, and then we're going to talk a bit about funding and trends in digital. And I thought, because... I'm making an assumption here, but I hope it's a correct assumption. Some of you would be interested in practical learning from this session. I've asked everybody to come up with one thing they've learned that's going to affect what they do in the future. So uh, we'll rattle on through. I've made some screenshots. I'm going to start off with you, sir, Nick, who has started his own social network. It's fascinating. Hi, Nick Davis from Nobly.com. Um, as Pippa says, I've uh, started a social network that connects companies to community projects. So on one side of this digital platform, a community can start a project and tell their story and get their friends and neighbours involved by sharing. And on the other side, companies can search using tags to find projects where they can make the greatest difference. And the algorithm, of course, matches them up. from you, so you, do you, mind, you can just chip on in, okay? <laughs> All right, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Hoss. I'm from Vocalize.org. And in fact, we have a synergy. Uh, I love it when these things happen. You're sitting next to someone, you think, wow. Um, Vocalize is all about uh, the crowdsourcing of the ideas in the first place. Um, so it's, it's a, a disruptive technology. Instead of telling people that you've got a brilliant idea and then foisting it on them, you simply ask the question, We've used it in mainly education and large organizations. It has um, really helpful use for companies looking for innovation within their staff, but also customer service satisfaction. And it's a, a digital platform developed in Wales. Very good, okay, who's next? Right. That's me. Yeah. Hello, I'm Delith Harris and I'm representing the Digital Volunteers. Uh, it's a new organisation, it's a community interest company that we've set up specifically to encourage um, children to volunteer, or children or young people actually, between the ages of 13 and 24, to volunteer to run uh, digital coding clubs. So the coding clubs are being run at schools, and, but we're trying to encourage young people to actually volunteer to teach the coding. So not only to be able to transfer their own skills, but also to help the young people to build their confidence, improve their communication skills, and give them something concrete that they can put onto their CVs. And we're hoping that all of this, you know, for the kids at the schools who are being taught, but also the kids who are teaching, uh, will really get inspired um, to, to take up a career um, in the digital world, which is what I'm passionate about. Great, thank you. Hi, uh, uh, Will uh, from A Thousand Lives Improvement. Uh, we're the Quality Improvement Service in NHS Wales. Um, my background um, is, is kind of third sector and, and using um, existing tech, as you were talking about, um, to, to be digital for good. And um, uh, uh, how, sorry, how uh, NHS Wales can use digital better um, uh, and improve their service through, through digital. Yeah. My name is Ben. I work for a social enterprise called Big Click, and we're based in a charity in the Rhondda. And we we essentially we, we develop apps, and mainly educational apps at the moment, focusing on the Welsh language, but also apps that are um, engaging with young people, but also showing communities on how they can uh, use this new technology to answer some of the needs that they're trying to address. So it could be poverty, it could be um, starting fires on the mountains, it could be a, a range of things. And I think there's a, there's a real gap for the third sector to utilize even more technology in how they deliver their services. Okay, great. Good. Let's start with Nick then. I want to ask you a little bit about, you've chosen to keep your new social network in the private sector. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that, about how the money works really? Good question. We were just talking about this. So um, as someone who's starting a, what I would call a social purpose business, you've got to make that decision very quickly. How are you going to achieve your vision? And with the Nobly vision, um, what we've got with the concept is something that's actually globally unique. We've got a real opportunity to help 
international companies who genuinely do want to get more involved in grassroots um, community projects, but not just the big guys, also small companies locally who want to get more involved. We've got an opportunity to help them all around the world. That's going to take quite a bit of time, effort and money to get done. So we had to make a decision early that if we tried to start as a social, as a social enterprise, we would always struggle to access finance, because I don't know if you know, but if you're a social enterprise, you're not allowed to raise money from private markets. So we had to make the decision to go for profit. We then started exploring, well, how do we anchor our social purpose into the business? Do we create a charter? Do we determine that 15% of our net profits, when we get there, go back into community projects through our own platform? But we've, um, we've recently decided that the right way to go is via B corporations. And B corporations, if you haven't seen them, is a, a new initiative coming out of the US. It basically anchors social purpose into the legal framework of your for-profits company so that you are forced to consider what's in the interest of shareholders by way of profit, but also what's in the interest of communities, people, and the environment, planet as well. And it creates a legal change in your company statute. It's definitely the way to go for us, and I believe for any other social purpose business that doesn't feel enterprise is quite the right way to go. Good. Good. Anybody want to add anything to that? No? Okay, Ben. Now, just before we were chatting before this session, um, we were talking about new technology, and you've obviously brought out this app, and you've got some quite strong views on it. On, uh, so do, would you like to tell us about them? Yeah, well, I, Big Click has grown out of a, a, a community development charity that's been working in, uh, on a housing estate in the Rhonda for nearly 25 years. So we, we grew from working closely with people and kind of using very traditional models of how do we engage with people. Um, so it was a lot of face-to-face, -face, it was a lot of uh, filling in forms and, and collecting paperwork. And so, and as we grew and, and we initially started off as a training uh, arm of the organization showing people how to use digital technologies, we realized that there's a real gap in, in kind of a lot of the conversations that are happening in this place today about innovation and moving forward and kind of, you know, what the next 10 years looks like. And we have noticed that there's, there's this whole sector of charity organizations, community groups, schools that are being left behind a bit who still don't know how to engage effectively with Facebook and, uh, and use mobile technology and, have, and even consider how an app on a phone might help them uh, in, this, in the classroom or in, the, in this charity. So I think there's a lot of work still to be done in how the third sector harnesses this power and, and becomes more innovative in it because the, the private sector is doing it, businesses are doing it, and because there's a financial incentive for them to do it. Um, but I think there's a social incentive for us to realize that we can make a massive impact um, with much less investment. And a quick example is uh, the first three apps that we made, uh, we were funded by the Welsh Government to make uh, three Welsh language apps, and we did it, worked directly with two local schools, Welsh language schools, and we answered a direct need in the classroom. The handwriting style that they wanted to teach the children wasn't being taught on any other app that existed. So we've made those apps for them, uh, and, and another numeracy app as well. And those apps have now been downloaded over 18,000 times. So we answered a direct need in the schools, for in, in a very small part of the Rhonda, but now over 20,000 children have used our apps across Wales. And, and that was three people in a room in 10 weeks. So if we were gonna go out and deliver that same type of um, impact to 20,000 children in the traditional third sector approach, which is face-to-face -face and lots of projects, and it would have been, we, we wouldn't have been able to do it for the cost. And, um, and, and so it, it shows how easily you can make something and get it out there using digital. Okay. And on that theme, then, I'd like to ask Matt a little bit about moving from the private sector to Oxfam. You know, what did you have to get your head drowned? Uh, what were you able to bring and contribute to the party because of your private sector background? Those types of issues. I think the main thing for me was just to be very sort of single-minded about what is the core objective we're trying to do. So Oxfam as, a, as an organisation has lots of different things going on. There are some people who, are, as I mentioned earlier, who are interested in um, pushing an issue. So they're saying we want people to be advocates of this particular um, this thing that's going on. 
and then other people saying we want people to come to our online shop. You know, those two things coexisting is difficult to do. So I think sometimes sort of stopping and saying, hang on, what's the, what's the thing that we're trying to work on here? And then what are the peripheral benefits as well? That's all fine, but what's the, the, core, the, core, the core objective? So that for me is the main thing. Okay, and now I think it'd be good to ask Dallas and Sarah about you, you're both concerned with education. So what are the distinctive challenges there? So if... And then I'll be asking you for questions in about three minutes, okay? Uh, yes, that's an interesting one. We hear a lot about citizenship and uh, de the democratic deficit issues of young people not feeling engaged in the political process. I mean, that's very much been at the fore with the, in the build-up to the general election. Um, in my view, we start to uh, develop citizenship in our young people when they start to take part in decision-making in their institution. It isn't so much about which political party would they like to vote for. Um, and the way that I've done it so far is to simply pose very open questions to young people. Give them a, a digital platform so that it's not, um, and it's not a social platform, so it's not about your, your profile pic or how many followers you have. It's not a personality competition. It's a sort of semi-anonymous platform. But say to these young people, what ideas do you have to improve your education? And, uh, and then just step back. And uh, I found um, young people to be extraordinarily sensible in their suggestions. And then, crucially, um, the, the ideas that get honed through the rating and debating um, on a platform and, indeed, in a face-to-face -face situation then need to be turned into action because otherwise they say it doesn't matter what we say, nothing ever changes. And so that is, the, again, so important. And once young people see the change they then start to feel that they are active. And in calling the decision makers to account, they turn themselves into active citizens in their school or, or university or college. And they then take that into their lives and into their, their normal everyday life in their communities. I'll have to send you my son who voted for the Cannabis Party in the last election. <laughs> now, what, what, about, what, what about the challenges that you face? Because you, you work in schools as well, don't you? Yeah, we work with schools. And I, I guess not in every instance, but some of the challenges that we do have is actually getting airtime um, because, you know, teachers and children are already overloaded. Um, and we're trying to, whilst we're trying to offer a service which we believe, you know, is helpful to them and, and they agree that it's helpful to them, it's about getting their time and getting their staff, because we still need their staff to stay on, you know, after schools and to help us get logistics set up, etc. So, so it's very much about airtime, I think. Um, w once you do get the engagement and the commitment, then, you know, you're off and running. But I think it's that initial hurdle to get in there until they can see what you're delivering, um, they can understand the model. You know, we're trying to do things slightly differently with engaging, you know, young people and children volunteering as well. So it's a little bit different from what they may be used to. Um, but once you're over that first hurdle, then, you know, we'll be able to hopefully grow through word of mouth. But we are really very much at the beginning. So we haven't, you know, yet had that, um, you know, reputation being built. Okay, and I'm going to ask you the same question, Will. We all feel we own the NHS, we all have views on it, so you must have quite a lot of distinctive challenges. There are, there, I mean, there are a lot of challenges, and I, I'd, I'd say the, the main one that I'd want to pick out really is, is the existing technologies um, from third sector background. Is, you know, Matt was talking around um, them using it for promotion, to create uh, engaging communities, and then to drive that into fundraising. I think uh, certainly in health and maybe public sector across the board that there's a lot of existing technologies out there and um, that aren't being utilised um, to their full potential at the moment. Um, there's a lot of talk around digital innovation and you know what's the next big thing and how, how can we do this but actually there's stuff out there that, that we can already use um, and certainly in, in health I think there's a massive potential just for learning and sharing um, because it kind of gives people the headspace and uh, you know things like I'm talking social now, really. Um, that there's there's other people just like you in the same situation that you wouldn't be able to have a chat with and and work out the best solution for whatever you might be going to. But things like a social platform, those digital tools that already exist, allow you to do that. And I've certainly seen in my in my time in 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 health that they're using those platforms the most to gain the best learning and and change what they're doing, make a real difference. Um, but 
almost away from, from organizations. They're doing it off their own back, which I find fascinating. Yeah, I know um, uh, in the health board in Swansea, they've just got a pilot called I Want Great Care. And, uh, and I mean, that is such a great name, actually. So patients use, get on that pilot, and they give, you know, they describe their experience, but they also give, uh, you know, by default, um, very useful clinical data as well. So government, Welsh government is just funding that, isn't it? And, you know, there's things like patient opinion out there and similar yeah. platforms that are, uh, you know, message boards or stuff like that that allow patients to give their feedback and, and health boards or healthcare professionals to respond and better themselves with that. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, questions, please. Anybody got anything they want to ask about? Yeah, okay. Hi, my name's uh, Adam, and I have a question for Nick, really, and it's about the B Corp. As I understand it, there's an application process. Um, I was just wondering if you could sort of expand a little bit on that, how long it took, and what was the one most challenging thing going through that application sure. process? Sure. Okay, so it's an incredibly stringent application process. You have to score 80 points out of 200. That sounds quite easy. But even a young startup like us that's founded in social purpose will probably score about a 90. So it's very, very hard to get in. And it's because it reviews every aspect of your business, your diversity policy. Are you encouraging staff uh, to cycle to work and therefore your carbon footprint, the, um, the bream status of your building? Are you putting profits back into community? It's the whole piece. And so therefore, I, I don't know what the highest score is, but I know that large corporates can't do it. Now, fascinatingly, Unilever have said they're going to try, but they probably project it'll take them years. And I don't know if you'll know, but Unilever are probably the poster boy uh, corporate in terms of their Paul Polman's ambition to be the most socially responsible global business. So it is very stringent. You are coached. So you do a first pass and you see how close you can get. And then you're coached on the areas where if you work a little harder, you can make up the most points. And you also have to renew every three years. So it's stringent. It needs to mean something. And, um, and they've set it out in that way. I think probably the most famous brand that's achieved it so far is Ben & Jerry's and um, Trieros Bank which is a bank based in the Netherlands but operating over here, is also has just achieved certification. So it's tough. Thank you. Okay, good. Anybody else? Got anything they'd like to ask? There's your last chance. Okay, well, I'm just going to ask everybody now, I mentioned at the beginning, what they've learned so far, one thing that's going to inform what they do in the future, um, and hopefully you'll find that useful in some way. So we'll start with you over there. So the one thing that's been learned so far that's... A yeah, in, in, in using digital, leveraging yeah. digital for non-profits, as we're meant to be yeah. talking about. Well, I, think, <laughs> I think, to be honest, it's about keeping it simple. So I, I always think of my mum and dad, and I think, will they get this? And will they get it very quickly? Because if there's any explanation required, it's failed, yeah. basically. Yeah. So um, that's it for me. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, we've come relatively uh, new to this, uh, to the digital sector as far as making something and, and pushing it out there. And what we've learned is that we were so used to kind of making something, uh, setting up a project in, in a local community and people would come to it and, and put a poster up and it was no problem. It turns out you actually have to tell people that this stuff is out there and that it exists. So there's a huge marketing element to digital that we weren't really prepared for. So. Um, it's taken us a year now to kind of finally get to the point where we know that we need to shout about it. So, And I have to say, I met Ben when he started doing his project. He had a really strong American accent, and now he almost sounds Welsh, doesn't he? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> uh, kind of in line with Ben, but looking more uh, internally, organisation and, and staff-wise, is that I think, like you're saying, there's a lot of work publicly to be done away from digital. I think there's a lot of work to be done offline to change the culture of an organization so they embrace digital whether that's existing platforms or open to, to new platforms so I think my key takeaway is it takes time which is frustrating because it's so fast-paced and, and moving but it's really important work to do the stuff offline as well as concentrate on the on on the public digital stuff as well right. okay Sarah 
I, I totally agree with that. Um, very often um, one sees people developing and then launching new platforms and it's the best thing since sliced bread. And when you go and analyse it, it turns out that they, they have no engagement. Um, and that is the key thing. Um, it isn't about the digital, it's about the people. Um, and that's what I've learned, is that you have to crack um, those engagement strategies. Um, if the digital... Uh, that you've developed is smart. It will become invisible and people will become comfortable with it. But if you don't have um, a route map for engaging people, it's never going to be more than a, a nice looking website. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Well, you must be on a very steep learning curve. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, um, this is flowing very nicely though. To, but to echo um, Sarah's point, um, I wanted to talk about people, uh, maybe less of a learning but more of an observation. So. We were talking before we came on about the concept of digital for good and, and we were talking about technology but actually it's not really about the technology right now, it's about the people. The technology is there, the ideas are there, plenty of them on the stage, many more of them out in the ecosystem but we are absolutely at a tipping point driven by millennials and Generation Z and whatever you want to call them of people who are actually starting to change their behaviour and they're starting to find ways to use digital technology for good and they expect it. They're trying to find ways to make their voices heard and there will always be commerce but there may not always be corporates. We have the power to change the way the world works today. Corporates need to reinvent themselves and people are starting to vote with their voices but also with their wallets and I think for me that's what Digital for Good is all about is how you use the technology and how you help people drive the change they want to see. I think the, the one thing, well, one of the things that we've learned, because we are learning a lot as a new organization, is the power of a brand. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm rather envious of Oxfam because everybody knows Oxfam. Um, you know, we're a new organization um, that is trying to establish itself, yes, within a local community, but, you know, more broadly across South Wales or across Wales. And trying to get your voice heard, you know, digital is great in the sense of social media and there's plenty of outlets to get the message out. But also there are so many other people also trying to get their message out that your message so easily gets lost. And I think, um, you know, when we look at social media, you need to build up that following, you need to build up the support. And, and still a lot of that is done in person and through your contacts and coming to events like this, you know, and getting your followers. But even if, you know, I had all the followers from Digital 2015 following the digital volunteers, um, and I sent you a message, it could well get lost in all of the other messages that you get from all of your other contacts. So I think, for me, it's about how do we build our brand and our credibility, and then when we do need to reach out, you know, our message does get heard amongst the plethora of other messages that are out there, so that we can actually, you know, get the support that we need when we need it. Okay, grand. Thank you. One last um, go. Anybody got anything else they'd like to say or ask? After? Yes, sir. Mike coming over. Hi, I'm Hi. Connor Mee from Proven Mentor. Uh, apologies for being a little bit late. It's all right. Um, I've just got a question generally for the panel about training, and it's about the people and making them very comfortable with the communication, and the communication is also two-way. Digital is fantastic for listening and engaging. Has anybody comments on training support for the people who work in businesses, not just the X or Y generation, but maybe some of the more senior people. Bring us up to speed quickly. Thoughts on that, please. Right, okay, who would like to kick off? Some of you have got quite a lot of people to train, I would think. Well, Big Click started off as a, as a training organization and, and we went into, um, mainly into libraries, uh, training individuals on how to use uh, di uh, digital technologies, emails, and, and so we, we kind of centered around showing it how it would improve what they already did. 
not showing them how to do something that they didn't really need to know how to do. Um, and that was our mistake when we first started. We thought, we'll show them all these amazing things that they don't even know they can do. And it turns out they didn't care, they didn't want to do. But how can it improve what they're actually doing? So how, how does it um, give them more time to do the other things they want to do or enhance what they already enjoy doing has been our approach to it. And that includes when we go into the workplace and we work with someone and we say, actually, we're going to make your job easier or more enjoyable by using this new technology. Any, any other comments on that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm based in a, a local FE college. And um, as far as I'm concerned, the digital uh, skills that our young people are picking up, there is a route map then for them to go out in placements and go and work um, side by side with businesses. And of course, young people particularly love doing this stuff. Um, and we haven't managed to do this yet but the vision is that and is just as the same as um, a young person is very capable of showing a business how to leverage themselves on social media how it comes very naturally to them that they will through training be able to have the experience at the college and then go off and become what I call a, a digital ninja and go and show um, local businesses, uh, find out what they want and do that stuff for them. I think it's a mistake to tell everybody that they've all got to do this stuff. Um, if you're keen, that's fine. But many people are really brilliant at what they do and they don't want to get, they have an accountant, they don't do it themselves. And I think there is a role there for enthusiastic young people to, um, and potentially work with several businesses um, and start to um, provide that sort of service, a new type of job, in fact. Nick? Um, so I'm just going to quickly give you a bit of my background in order to answer the question. I'm an ex-marketing guy, so I've spent a career working with big brands, and I, four or five years ago, got pretty tired of what I was doing in the teeth of the recession when I was trying to market cars, and I thought, this is bad. I really need to find something better to do. But at the same time, a lot of those big businesses also thought, this is bad. Trust is completely breaking down with society, and we need to reinvent ourselves and get properly re-engaged with communities. Hence, here I am. This is what I'm doing today. So I believe that big business can be a force for good if we help them to do so, because the motivation is there. So if you look at um, clients of mine like Marks and & Spencers and Starbucks, we have an ambassador role within our site, so they can empower their staff to go out and help communities in whatever way they see fit. If you look at Barclays and the Digital Eagles program that they've got, they've now got 11,000 trained branch staff to go out and help people in the community upskill on their digital knowledge because they're motivated by inclusion and they want to help their staff to help because it makes a big difference to them. People want to work for companies that allow them to go and help people. So there's a huge movement towards big companies properly taking responsibility for this and helping to train people right the way across society. And I want to help them do that. And I think most people here probably do as well. I, I, this is a very interesting area to me because I teach software for a lot of universities to business people. And one of the ways in which um, it seems to go well is if you get people hugely engaged with the content first. So, for instance, if you get everybody to do a storyboard of an infographic of their business and enterprise and they get great pictures and they're bursting to tell the story and then you get them to open the infographic software, they will learn that software into 10 minutes, you know, I won't have to teach them because they'll be so keen to communicate that content. So it's, it's a fascinating area how you teach people these new skills, I think. So thank you for the question. A anything else before we finish? Okay, well, I think our speakers are involved in fascinating projects and they've spoken very well about them. So can you all give them a bit of appreciation, please? Thank you. Thank you, everybody.